Hello, it's very nice to be back here again. I've spoken in this um, hall and at a Republic event before. Is my voice reaching to the back? Is that okay? Thanks. Right, okay. Um, when Graham asked me to think about what the Jubilee means to me, I immediately had the same thought, which is um, uh, the Queen was on the throne when I was born, has been ever since, and nobody has ever allowed me a say in who the head of state should be. Um, and the consequences of that are I would like a, you know, a possible head of state who is black or Asian or Jewish or openly gay or not just a representative, <laughs> not just a representative of one family and one class. And it seems to me extraordinary that a, a kind of lack of faith in democracy itself. People say to me, "Oh, but we might we might choose the wrong person as president. Um, we might choose Elton John or, or Victoria Beckham." And I can't actually see that's worse than one of the Windsors. But at the same time, we actually trust ourselves to elect politicians who will actually take us to war, who will send young men and women to die abroad in causes that they might not necessarily believe in. Yet we don't seem to trust ourselves to, to, to <coughs> choose someone who will basically turn up at ceremonial events, greet foreign heads of state, and speak for the country on occasions when something dreadful happens. And I think that, is, that should be one of the ideas that's in our Jubilee um, campaign, that if we trust ourselves, then of course we can elect a president. And the great thing about electing a president is that if they're really crap, after four years, we'll have learned a lesson and we'll have somebody else. But at least it will actually reflect the modernity and diversity of this country, instead of having this one family. Um, I'm also concerned that... I've been looking at the coverage very, very carefully since the royal wedding. And um, before I came out today, I went on the, Ma the Daily Mail website, which is you know one of the daily chores I do as a journalist, and um, to see what they, what story they're leading on the website. And I've been following this for several days now. And as you all know, there's a huge story at the moment in this country about ethics and morals and so on. And it's one I have a personal interest in since the police contacted me in April and told me that my phone had probably been hacked by. Um, a private detective working for the News of the World. So I checked the Mail website to see what they're leading on at this extraordinary moment in our democracy. And it's William and Kate in Canada for the fourth day running. Um, and the story is um, David Beckham went on his own to a party that, to meet William and Kate. And the Mail is very worried and wants to know why Victoria wasn't there. And I think probably the fact that she's going to give birth tomorrow may have something to do with it. But this, this story of this couple, who may be perfectly nice, but are not very interesting, getting in and out of boats and putting on hats and taking off hats, I think it's actually been used not just um, in a kind of sycophantic way, but in actually quite a cynical way, because the male, on, the male and the male on Sunday, of course, don't really want to cover and never have wanted to cover, cover the hacking story. And I think the royal family, in circumstances like this, they serve almost as human shields. Um, and you can, you can fill pages and use up lots and lots of photographic space um, and, and present this as a kind of feel-good story on the back of we all, the nation, love the wedding. And personally, I get very, very fed up with being told that the nation does this or that or the other because I, I'm always one of the people who doesn't feel whatever is being claimed. And um, I certainly didn't have this feel-good um, reaction to the wedding. But I've noticed that what's happening is a separation is opening up in the middle market papers between um, Charles, who everyone clearly thinks is a disaster, and, and William and Kate. And so last week, um, the Mail um, had some very, very critical coverage of Charles's financial arrangements um, after this astonishing revelation that in a year when people are losing their jobs right, left, right and centre, he has increased his personal staff by 10 to 159. Um, and these appear to be aides and butlers and dressers and hairdressers and website managers and um, all the people that most of us manage to do without in our daily lives. I mean, I'm always very st struck by how the, the royal family are infantilised. I mean, they seem able not to put their own clothes on or kind of brush their own teeth. Um, and, and I wouldn't mind that if it wasn't at our cost that this is being done. But the, but the Prince of Wales did actually make an important concession, which is although his personal spending went up two and a half million last year, he has imposed a pay freeze on all of his staff. So uh, he's, not, um, he's not leaving us all to, to, to rot entirely on her own. He's making his, his little contribution. But what's interesting to me about this, and, and then of course there was the, the, the whole slew of stories about Charles interfering. 
Um, and, and he got a lot of criticism for that. And I think that story is important because anybody who has any involvement with politicians and government knows that this goes on all the time. I mean, I remember a friend of mine first being appointed a government minister back in 2001, and within two weeks he was saying, you'll never guess what's happened. I've had a letter from Prince Charles. And it actually started, dear minister, it really is appalling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rather like a private eye parody. Um, and, and ministers were getting the, are getting these all the time from Charles. And I think that's another possible um, m method of attack for us next year. Because it is, as Graham says, it's a much more political occasion. And this is a family who interferes left, right and centre, morning, noon and night. Um, what they're not used to is being challenged and over the last few years, um, for various complicated reasons, I, I've ended up going to quite a lot of events at Buckingham Palace and also at the Palace of Holyrood Rood in Scotland. And so I've act I actually go partly because I pay taxes, so why shouldn't I, but also because it's fascinating to see these people close up. When I was on Newsnight the week before the wedding, I was on with um, one of those kind of royal sticker fans, Hugo Vickers, and he was saying, oh, you know, the thing about the Queen is she's absolutely marvellous because, you know, she's so good at her job, and the thing is she knows what to do, and she never interferes in politics. And I said, this is just not true. It's not just Charles who interferes, it's the Queen. And I said that I'd... Be, I'd witnessed her make an unconstitutional remark at a party. And the next day I was phoned by various newspapers, so I actually put an account of this on my website. And um, what happened was I, I went to a Christmas party at Buckingham Palace, which was mainly for politicians. And um, the, the kind of Ruritanian aspect of this is very extraordinary. So after a while, um, I was approached by a little man who was about five feet tall, wearing knee breeches, who said to me, um, I'm going to bring Her Majesty in the room in five minutes. Are you prepared to meet Her Majesty? So I said, yes, fine, of course. So I, I get put in the corner with a clutch of MPs and a couple of MEPs, and the Queen is brought in. And um, someone introduces me to the Queen and says, this is Joan Smith, she's a novelist and a journalist. And the Queen looks at me and I say, hello, and I don't curtsy. And the Queen looks absolutely aghast. <laughs> and everybody goes completely silent for about two minutes. And then she moves on. She cuts me dead. She moves on to the next person. And I thought, well, obviously she doesn't have my manners, but, you know, she's elderly, so I'll make an allowance for this. But then she turned back to um, an ex-minister and said, you know, uh, no, the next thing that happened was there's a Tory MP there whose wife is Turkish. And he introduced his Turkish wife. And the, and said, you know, she's from Istanbul, and she said, and the Queen immediately said, oh, Philip and I went on a state visit to Istanbul, and uh, the, this, this woman said, you know, we were, we were very touched and honoured that Your Majesty and Prince Philip came, etc., etc. <laughs> so then suddenly the Queen turns to an ex-minister and says, um, you know, um, the EU's getting awfully large these days, 28 countries. And he says, well, it's only 27, ma'am, but we are hoping that Turkey will come in very soon. And the Queen says... Oh no, we don't want Turkey coming in for a long time. <laughs> and I just stood there and thought, A, that's unconstitutional. B, is there anybody else you'd like to cut or insult? Because she's, you know, she's only just walked into the room. What I thought was extraordinary about that was the casual way in which she did it. She offered an incredibly controversial political opinion, and she did it in front of a group of people who included ministers, total strangers, journalists like me. So um, I, I described all this, put it on my blog, it got into the Telegraph. The Telegraph rang the, um, the palace and said, is it true that the Queen um, expressed a view on that Turkey shouldn't come into the Un European Union for a long time? And um, the palace said, um, she may have said something of the sort, but it's obviously been taken out of context. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just thinking, what, what other context could there be? Was she talking about a different turkey? Um, it's the one I don't know about. <laughs> um, and the, but they also, I was, I was very touched by this, that they, they rather sniffily, a palace spokesman said... Um, and we also understand that Miss Smith is one of the country's leading Republicans, i.e. I'm not a trustworthy source. <laughs> but, what, but what interests me about that is there is a kind of conspiracy of silence. And I'm sure that, you know, the Queen in her 60-year, almost 60-year reign didn't choose that particular evening in Buckingham Palace in front of a journalist to make an incautious and political remark. It must be going on on a much wider scale than that. And they are protected by silence, you know, there's this idea that um, you, don't, you don't say what goes on. I was at a garden, garden party there two or three years ago, a famous occasion when there was a monsoon. 
and suddenly the heavens opened and it was hailing. And there's this wonderful tannoy announcement that the royal family is now being evacuated. <laughs> and we're all left in the garden. So all these kind of scout leaders and mayors and county councillors and so on, we're all just left to get wet. So everybody has to kind of pile into the tea tent. And it was so, the rain was so heavy, it was bouncing on the lawn and bouncing back into the tent. It's the only time in my life I've had, um, I, I, I've had uh, hailstones in my stilettos. Um, and what was extraordinary was that they didn't open in the palace, which a normal set of people would do, if you have a very large palace with a ballroom and lots of kind of chain, you know, sort of reception rooms and so on, and you have approximately 4,000 people getting soaked in your garden, you would think you'd invite them in. <laughs> but these people don't. And it just surprises me that so few people are willing to talk about that side of them, just how bad they are at their yeah. job. Um, and I, I, on the occasion when the Queen made this incautious remark, I thought almost anybody I can think of would do a better job than this. You know, to be casually racist like that and make a slighting remark about an entire country, um, not even bothering to find out who you're speaking to, um, is pretty extraordinary. And so I think given that next year is a much more political um, event than the supposedly private wedding. I think there are a number of, of uh, lines of attack which just occur to me that would be helpful. One of them is attacking this notion that, you know, Charles may be a bit flaky, um, but William and Kate are great and the Queen has done an incredibly good job. I would argue the Queen has done the opposite. The Queen is a sort of dead hand on, on this country. And one of the things that worries me about the way this family is used is I think the press um, and the whole sort of democratic process is in for a very rough 18 months to two years. I think there will be prosecutions, people will be going to prison. And they can always use the royal family as a diversionary tactic because this woman Kate seems to have an endless capacity to wear really boring dresses and get into every, every newspaper. And, and I, I think there is a place for complaining about this, and I think the BBC particularly is, is, is vulnerable on this, because I'm just staggered by the amount of free publicity that newspapers and public service broadcasting organisations like the BBC give to these people. And I think the thing is that we just haven't challenged enough in the past. And I know it's boring to ring up and complain or it's boring to send an email, but it's effective. I was talking to, I had a meeting with um, a shadow industry minister at the House of Commons a couple of weeks ago to talk about another issue. And he said to me, if an MP gets one letter, then he or she is alerted to the fact that there's an issue. If you get 10, it suddenly rises to the top of your agenda. And, and I think we don't appreciate that enough, that you know, we should go to, we should actually bombard newspapers with complaints about their oil coverage, the BBC, um, we should go to MPs and MEPs and raise all these questions about democratic accountability and so on. Um, also, um, I, I, I think we have to be very wary of um, William and Kate being turned into some kind of iconic family, you know, sort of, it's a rerun of Charles and Diana, but this time it's going to work. And that is a real, that's one of the biggest dangers I see for us, because they seem to be quite amiable um, and, you know, friendly, and they're young. And I think the prob one of the problems, as we know, with the hereditary principle is you end up with a very elderly head of state. Um, I mean, the Queen was born in the same year as Marilyn Monroe, but, um, you know, she's, she's now at an age when, where most people will be thinking about retirement. Um, so, what, what bring, bringing new blood into the family is a way of getting round the, the endless photographs of the same people over and over again. So, I think we have to be very wary and not attack this couple personally, but I think we have to make it clear that they are part of the problem.